Welcome, this is the NKBA, and you are here for the second webinar of the month. Uh, this month we're featuring Living in Place, or uh, as some of you may know it, Universal Design. Today's session is called The Magnetism of the Kitchen with Steve Hoffaker, who is CAPS, CEAC, SHSS certified. We'd also like to thank Gebert for their generous sponsorship for uh, all of the webinars for the month of September. And Steve, if you're there, we're ready to get started. Thank you so much. I, I am here. Thanks very much, Debbie. You're welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, again, I would like to thank Gebert for their sponsorship and for everyone for giving an hour of their day to be with us. I see you know, we've got a great attendance today, and I see some of the names are familiar. I recognize them from uh, different places we may have met or some of you have attended a program that I've done before, and thanks for having me back to do another program. So this is great. We're going to have a good time as we go along for the next 60 minutes or so. Uh, I will talk for uh, a little while, and maybe some time for questions at the end. I would ask, though, if you have questions, Debbie will uh, choose the questions, she'll read them, and I'll answer them. We won't uh, necessarily get to all the questions if there's ones that we don't have the time for. Uh, feel free to uh, text me, email me, whatever uh, works for you, and I will respond to you after the webinar is over. Uh, we won't be getting into specific product or brands or anything like that, so if you've got a question about uh, what's a good brand for this or a good product or what have I seen that I would recommend. Uh, let's keep it more general than that. But with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, let you know a little about myself and then we'll get into the program. Steve, are you speaking? You don't hear me. And now I do. I've been speaking. You haven't heard anything so far? Uh, not yet, but you're sounding better. Your your voice sounds a little bit um, muffled there, so I think you're sounding clearer now. Should we start over? Uh, well, we can start right here. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Steve Hoffaker, a uh, certified agent place specialist, a certified environmental access consultant with SEAC, and a senior home safety specialist, SHSS. I've been in the housing business for, for decades, uh, starting out as a city planner, doing many years uh, of consulting and on-site sales and design and uh, land acquisition and development with the uh, home building industry. I have a uh, broker's license uh, for real estate in the state of Florida. So a lot to do with housing over the years. As I was saying, for the, uh, I don't know if everyone heard this or not, but we're going to be doing questions at the end. Please hold your questions. I want to thank everyone for giving up an hour of your day to be with us. We will cover a lot of topics, and if there's something specific that we're not covering that you have, would like to know more about, uh, submit it uh, on the, uh, the chat form that you have. Uh, Debbie will go through them and pick uh, the ones that are most applicable to the entire audience, and we'll address those at the end. If we don't get to your question, or if you've got a question that relates specifically to a product or a brand, uh, feel free to uh, text me or email me uh, offline, and I will get to that with you. Uh, we want to try to keep things that apply across the board as much as possible, more generic rather than specific to a product or a brand. I had mentioned at the outset, so I want to thank Deborah for uh, their uh, sponsorship again, and. Uh, hello to those of you that I have met along the way or who have attended a previous program that I've done. Uh, that said, I also have a, a blog that you will find on my website, uh, formerly called Aging in Place Insider. It's a standalone, but you can access that through my website. I also have two groups that are free to join on LinkedIn and Facebook, so whichever your favorite platform is, or if you like both. It's called Aging and Accessibility, which you'll see uh, right here. And those are uh, free to join, and we have content all the time. And as a member of the group, you are free to post your own content as well. And over the past uh, dozen or more years, I've been working primarily in the aging and place industry, aging and place universal design, visibility, which gave us the, uh, the idea for today's program. 
which is to begin thinking of the kitchen as magnetic, just as a magnet. Attracts a uh, revolve plate with magnets. We hold these you know, magnets to hold uh, our children's and grandchildren's pictures on the refrigerator to post uh, doctor's appointment cards and different things on it. So as a magnet attracts and holds things to it. Uh, let's begin thinking of the kitchen. That's how we're going to look at our time today. Of thinking of the kitchen as magnetic. Uh, when we come into a home, we are drawn to the kitchen. When people shop for a home. They look at the kitchen when people think of design changes for their home. They think, if not first, in the top one or two of the kitchen. So it's so magnetic. If we think back to older homes, as uh, some of us have been to a maybe a colonial home or a restoration, or we've seen uh, documentaries or travel logs, the kitchen it was such an important part of the home. It's where the cooking was done, it's where the heat was, a simple heat. Many times uh, people slept in the kitchen when they were large enough. We did our homework there, we baked, we ate, we fellowship. So the kitchen is still important as it always has been. And that's what we mean by thinking of the kitchen as magnetic. When guests come to visit us, uh, they, it was a time, and in many urban cities, it's still that way when people uh, that know us, they don't come to the front door. They come to the side door or the rear door and they come right into the kitchen. Sometimes they help themselves to a cup of coffee if there's a pot. Uh, they sit and they visit and they share news and uh, updates with us. Now, some kitchens have, are, are real structured and they have four walls, uh, just like any other room in the home. And we think of the kitchen in that way and we remodel our kitchen cabinets, uh, appliances, flooring, lighting within the parameters of those four walls. Others are more open with just one or maybe a couple of walls. Here's a kitchen with four walls. Uh, here's one that's much more open that spokes out into the rest of the home. So you have other parts of the home that are connected from the kitchen. Either way, it uh, doesn't matter, but we have that to contend with. Some of them even can extend to the outside area where we have the patio that it all draws back from the kitchen that emanates from there, from the magnetic aspect of the kitchen. And as we think of the kitchen as being magnetic, as being attractive, as drawing people to it, we have to look at it in a number of different ways other than other rooms in the home. Uh, no other room in the home is as public as the kitchen. Our bedrooms are private. Our bathrooms are private. We invite friends and relatives, maybe into the family room or the media room or the living room or the basement to be with us. But the kitchen is open. We have a party. We entertain. We have neighbors that drop by. We have an insurance agent. We have someone coming to uh, show us something that we might want to purchase, or we set an appointment with them. They come to the kitchen. The kitchen is a public area. We have a table in the kitchen, or we have an island in the kitchen, or we have a table nearby in a dining space, or sometimes we have a dining bar at the kitchen. But anyway, we have a an area where people come and be with us in the kitchen, in the kitchen area. As I said, when we begin thinking of home design, whether it's designing the home initially with an architect or a building designer or an interior designer, kitchen and bath designer, we think of the kitchen, if not number one, certainly at our top two or three rooms in the home, we want the kitchen experience. When we begin remodeling our homes, when we look at a design shows on television, when we go to a home and garden show, that kitchen is right up there at the top. Uh, magazines and, and other uh, resources that are available to us, we think of the kitchen. When we remodel our home for resale purposes, we think of the kitchen. So the kitchen uh, is so important because it has 
uh, an element of our personality. It's where we interact with the outside world. It's where we receive guests. It's where we entertain. It's where we take our nourishment. It's where we feed our families. Uh, there's so much going on in the kitchen. We spend so many of our waking at home hours there, whether it's just to pass through and get a cup of coffee or a glass of water or a sandwich, or as children sometimes you know, see, even as adults, we park ourselves in front of the refrigerator, open the door and just stare there as if we're going to get some kind of revelation uh, for something to eat or something is going to be there now that wasn't there 10 minutes ago the last time we looked. We're going to stay in front of the refrigerator for inspiration. With the fact that the kitchen is so public and that we've got so many people coming into it, we need to take special note and consideration of it. And I, I like the lineup that we've got that Debbie mentioned the shows that are coming up over the, over the coming weeks. You've got a fantastic lineup and I encourage you to attend as many of them as you can. Again, talking about universal design, visibility, the aspect that we are putting so many people of various needs and abilities and sizes and ages in the kitchen space. So having sufficient walkways, having the ability to reach cabinets, uh, whether they're lower cabinets or upper cabinets, or maybe there's no upper cabinets at all, the appliances, the controls, Having the ability to use those is so important because we never know necessarily who's coming into our home. We know who lives there, but coming in from the outside, that's a different story. Of course, we celebrate in our kitchens and, or nearby as we have here a, a feast, a Thanksgiving, a holiday celebration, a birthday party, an anniversary, a graduation. So as we begin planning our kitchen, again, whether it is something that already exists that we want to renovate, or it's a new home, or we're doing a total demo and redo, uh, if we're doing this for aging in place to remain in our homes so indefinitely, if we're doing this to bring additional people into the home, whatever the reason, uh, we are thinking of the kitchen. And let's look at some of what I call the moving parts of the kitchen. And as we do this, we should remember that function and safety within that kitchen are just as important, and you could argue more important, than aesthetics. So it needs to work well in addition to looking uh, good and proper. The aisleways, as I mentioned, that's the space that we use to get between the cabinets. So this is our aisleway. It needs to be sufficiently wide. Now, the NKBEA uh, guidelines suggest that between a perimeter cabinet and an island, that there should be a minimum of four to five feet, 48 to 60 inches. Uh, you see, we roughly have that here, but that's planning. And so many times it is narrower than that. Why does it need to be that wide? Well, if you want to open the dishwasher or you want to open the oven, you want to have one or more people in that space. You want to be here at the sink and if you still have someone here at the cooktop, that's an important consideration and factor, and that's why we need it wider. Now, you put someone in there with a walker or a wheelchair or someone who wants to sit because it's comfortable for them, that's all part of why we have wider aisles. Now, it might not be uh, allowable to have, in terms of space to have an island or not to have one as large as we would like, because that would compromise the amount of space that we have to move around in the kitchen. That's why the aisles are important. Lighting. We do so many things in the kitchen. We cook, we prepare food, we put food away when we bring it in from the grocery. Uh, we uh, put the food away after we've cooked it, we clean up, we entertain, we sit there and have a glass of wine after dinner or a bowl of ice cream. The kids do their homework, we visit, we use our tablet. There's so many things going on in the kitchen. So we need to be very mindful of the lighting. Typically, there are at least three different lighting styles in the kitchen, not fixtures, but actual styles, uh, whether they are uh, pots or cans, recessed lighting, whether they are under cabinet lighting or toe kick lighting or soffit lighting or pendant lighting, workspace under cabinet lighting, 
just a lot of different opportunity for lighting. And the more bright the kitchen is in terms of lighting, the safer we can be. Again, with that many people coming to the kitchen, with that many activities, safety is a real concern. Now, it's true that the bathroom is probably the riskiest area in the home. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, tells us that roughly a quarter of a million people, 234,000, so roughly a quarter of a million people every year are injured in the bathroom to the point where they need emergency room help. They are transported to the hospital or the family member takes them because they've fallen in the bathroom. Bathrooms have hard surfaces, they're wet, they tend to be a little confined in terms of space. So we want to make sure that our kitchens are not confining, that we have space to get around, that there's hard surfaces here as well, but there's other things that can happen in the kitchen. We can cut ourselves with a knife or a uh, slicing blade. We can cut ourselves and get a paper cut or a cut from a can or a bottle we drop and break something and then there's broken glass. We can burn ourselves. Uh, maybe burn our fingers, uh, reaching for a pan or a pot, maybe it starts to fall, we open the oven door, we get our arm in contact with the glass or with the, uh, the shelf that pulls out. Uh, we might burn ourselves in terms of taking in too hot of liquid too quickly or tasting or sampling something that we should let cool for a moment. There's just so many uh, things that can happen. Burns, cuts, we can open a cupboard or a cabinet and something heavy can fall that was uh, near the edge can fall and either bounce and then hit us in the leg, it could hit us in the foot. We could uh, try to pick something off of a top shelf and the load could shift and it could twist uh, our, our wrist or our forearm, injure our shoulder. There's a lot of risk in the kitchen, so we want to be careful of that. We could slip as we drop water because there's water in the kitchen. There's liquids, there's gravies and juices and uh, uh, oils and things that are in the kitchen. Not like the bathroom because we do have a little bit more open area and we don't expect there to be uh, moisture, but there can be, we know that. So we wanna be careful in designing the flooring and in designing the surfaces that we have the ability to move around safely. The work triangle, you're familiar with that, which uh, that, now that's largely being redefined. The traditional work triangle is the, the sink, the cooktop or the, the slide-in stove or range, and the refrigerator. And the, uh, you'll recall from your NKBA guidelines that we want no leg to be less than four foot, although that's probably pretty close there and no leg to be longer than nine feet, which I think we're okay. So that the total addition of the three legs of the triangle would not be more than 27 feet, nor less than 12 feet. Also, we wanna make sure that we are not encroaching on the corner of the island. So to go from the sink to the refrigerator, and we may have to walk around a little bit rather than walk straight to it. So in terms of design, we want to make sure that it's as open as possible and that we don't have to do a detour or a walk around to get there. Now, as I say, the, the work triangle is being redefined a little bit. That's because the traditional three appliances that we have, uh, the sink, the stove, and the refrigerator are being expanded and redefined in many spaces. So instead of the stove, the slide-in stove, which has a cooktop and an oven attached in one unit, and we still have that, but we also have wall ovens. We have microwaves either on top of the countertop or uh, installed in a cabinet or installed under the counter. We have under cabinet refrigerators. We have uh, drawer refrigerators. We have uh, secondary sinks, such as we have here. We have a sink over here in this design, and we have one in the island. Well, which is sink number one and which is sink number two? Well, that's going to be personal preference. So as I showed you this example here, uh, maybe this is the, the primary sink, and then we would look at this and this, but here, again, to go from this sink to the cooktop means that we have to walk around, which defeats the purpose 
of the triangle and access. So we'd have to look at that, a smaller island, moving the island down, relocating the sink in a redesign. Now, if this is the, the kitchen that we're dealt, then we work with it. So that's the work area, the work triangle, or as I prefer to call it, the kitchen geometry, which takes in maybe seven, eight different types of major appliances rather than just the traditional three. And then our work surfaces, our countertops, what are they made of? How porous are they? Are they treated to resist stains and scorching? Uh, are the corners rounded so that they don't present a sharp edge to be walked into and potentially injure or jab us? Uh, whether we have a table in the kitchen or we have the island. So what are our work surfaces like and how easy are they to keep clean? Storage, meaning cabinetry. We have wall cabinets, or in some cases, shelves. We have lower or base cabinets. And with that, we have a new dimension to the, the storage that we use. Instead of just opening the cabinet and having shelves inside or a corner base cabinet, uh, which has coined the term the blind corner, where we have a lazy Susan that lets us access the things that are immediately in front of us, but there's certain parts of that uh, around the corner where uh, it's just out of play. We don't have that open to us. So we have now the ability through a number of different companies uh, that uh, we have the ability for the shelves to rotate out, to pivot into position, to pull out and rotate. Are we getting much more utilization out of our base cabinets? We have shelves that pull out and then pop up into position. For upper cabinets, we have inserts that we can put in that allow the shelves to pull down. Uh, we have motorized shelves, uppers and lowers. We have doors that instead of opening out into the space, which then again affect our aisleway. I, so we talked about the aisleway, but if we have these doors open, if we have the dishwasher door down, if we have the oven door down, that's impacted our aisleway and made it tighter, in some cases, seal it off. So as we're able, instead of having the cabinet doors that are open and remain open, particularly with a large pantry or bifold doors that open and then tend to pinch back, or we open the refrigerator door across the opening and it remains open for a period of time while we're using it, we have doors that now will open horizontally or laterally. We also have doors that will open vertically or electronically, we push a button and it motors up into position. That's a savings uh, for us in terms of effort, but it's also a savings in terms of space utilization. And then the hardware for us. One of the, the chief things that we need to look at in terms of safety, and again, because we have so many people coming into a, a kitchen space, because it's magnetic, if you will, uh, we, we're drawing all these people to it, people from the outside, even total strangers, people that we don't know that are visiting us for the first time, or that we've invited them in for an appointment, or they're coming along with someone else for an event that we're having. And we don't know who they are, and we don't know their abilities. By having uh, upper cabinets with these small inch and a quarter holes on them, or even the cups we have now, see here, this example shows the loop. So having a loop or a bar, or something we can get our fingers in, accessing it from the top or from the bottom, allows much more freedom of access and makes it more versatile, more, more versatile, more universal, uh, more visitable. So that's all to be considered in lieu of a, a small uh, knob that has limited application. Someone who has swollen fingers or joints or doesn't have really good hand dexterity, doesn't have very good range of motion or muscle control, uh, those don't work here as well. So we want to think of that. Same thing with our faucets. How easy, how intuitive are they to turn them on and pop? And we have faucets now that are more automatic in terms of, of waving in front of them when they will come on, or even uh, air switches and other things that we can use. And then glare in the kitchen. And again, coming back to safety. As we're getting reflection from the overhead lights, and again, with the overhead lights, it's very typical for lights just to light the aisleway. 
but we need to light our work surface and we need to light it in such a way that it's not reflecting or creating undue glare. That time of day is gonna be part of it. So the windows that are in the kitchen, the uh, amount of light that we have on at one time. So balancing that light, having a good lighting technician to work with us or uh, using our design uh, background and experience to create the amount of the proper amount of light so that we are getting a good illumination, but not the reflection of the glare. The glare can actually create an, uh, more safety issues by masking surfaces, by making something look as if it's uh, closer or farther away than it is, or not even there at all. It can create on the floor, it can create a wet look when that's not even the case, and it can cause us to misstep or slip in anticipation of something we thought we would experience when we never do. And then our appliances, how easy are they to clean? Uh, are, they, uh, are they stainless? Are they matte finish? Are they large? Are they small? Are they sliding? Are they full length? Uh, the refrigerator freezers over and under, side by side, the armoire style with the French door top and the one or two drawers on the bottom, ice and water in the door, the cooktop, is it a traditional cooktop with gas or is it an electric cooktop or the newer induction style? Both the electric and the induction typically have a smoother glass top, which makes it easier to clean and to move uh, cooking pots and other vessels across it without the potential or possibility of them tipping, which you have on a, a gas cooktop where you've got the raised grates. And if you slide it off to the side of that, it has the potential to tip or to spill. Again, the wide aisleways, uh, the farm sink. Uh, this is another great innovation that we're, we're beginning to see. And that's taking the faucet and because we're having so many people in the kitchen, we, we want to move it from a straight 12 o'clock position uh, over to the side a little bit. Here, maybe closer to a uh, 11, 1030 position and over here to a 132 o'clock position. It opens up this space so it's much easier to clean. It's not a direct uh, visual connection and it's easier for someone with shorter arms or from a seated position to reach. Again, looking at the flooring, looking at the space, looking at the lighting, looking at the countertops, and even here, we're getting some incidents of maybe unplanned or unnecessary glare. So that's all something that we wanna take into account. We wanna make sure that there's sufficient contrast. While this is design is quite attractive, is there enough contrast between all of the cabinet surfaces, the ceiling, the flooring? Uh, that's something to be considered and, and answered. And sometimes the, uh, the island may turn out to be a little smaller or narrower than you originally planned. And you look at over here, you see there's not a lot of space to get through. So maybe in a kitchen this size, even though we like islands and they're very popular, um, maybe that's not the right answer or solution for this kitchen. So maybe we don't want an island. That's all something to be considered as well. Again, plenty of lighting over the, the work surface, over the island, over the eating area, under cabinet lighting, in cabinet lighting. Uh, again, a variety of lighting sources that we have available to us. And again, in terms of contrast, uh, as attractive as this kitchen is, you'll notice that there's a lot of similarities in patterns and colors, uh, which might be difficult for someone to discern or to wayfind uh, easily and safely. So it's just things to consider. Another great tool to use in the kitchen is the dropped eating counter. A typical counter is 36 inches. A bar top height that many of us include is 42 inches, but the drop eating surface at 30 inches gives us a chance to do two things. It lets us use a traditional height kitchen chair, uh, a chair from a, a kitchen uh, table and chairs, a chair from a desk, a chair from, let's say, the bedroom or another room in the home. 
uh, rather than having a limited number of higher bar type chairs, we're now able to include chairs around here. Someone in a wheelchair can easily uh, pull up to this without making any special accommodation. So it, it's quite versatile. It's a lower heating surface. Plenty of aisle way around this kitchen. So the dominance is the activity center. We visit it several times a day. It's also a fulfillment set where our needs are met. And it's a dependable, safe place. And we've talked a little bit about this, but let's expand these three topics uh, as we go through our presentation here. Uh, let's begin with the, the kitchen table, which is both a, an activity center and a fulfillment area. As we're drawn to the kitchen, we're also drawn to the table. Uh, people feel very ease, at ease and comfortable around it. Uh, rank, if you will, is reduced, so there's a, a greater air of informality where people are able to speak with each other more comfortably. Uh, if you, the uh, island, I talked about the table, but it could be an island. It could be uh, a countertop. It could be uh, it could be the dining room table or a breakfast area that's just outside the kitchen. But it's an area where we eat, where we do homework where we play cards or board games, where we sit to work with uh, our tablet to read, to have a cup of coffee, glass of wine, uh, a pre-bed uh, snack, ice cream, cake. Uh, that's what we're talking about with table. So use the word kitchen table uh, kind of inclusively to include more than just a traditional kitchen table or a table that might be found in the kitchen space. So everything from a game of solitaire by ourselves to uh, formalizing a real estate offer where we have the realtor come over and here's we're selling something, here's the offer to purchase, we're purchasing something, and your offer's been accepted, I need you to fill out these papers, I need your approvals here, uh, or we're planning that next vacation, we have all the brochures laid out, or we're accessing our notebooks or tablets and looking at the, uh, things like this, or we're doing the family budgeting, uh, we're paying bills, we're trying to, to make some semblance of the household budget. All of that and more homework, uh, if we have uh, school-aged children or grandchildren, that's all done at the kitchen table. As well as playing games and extending that family experience to all ages. Jigsaw puzzles for those who are still uh, fans of jigsaw puzzles. Dominoes, card games, I say solitaire board, uh, working with Play Doh or games, or even you know learning uh, skills as a young person. And as a as an activity center, that in addition to what we just looked at, uh, cooking and involving various members of the family, various ages, we have a chance for uh, cross generational uh, bonding and interaction. We walk into the kitchen to get me a, a glass of soda or a can or a bottle of soda, a cup of coffee. How many times a day might we do that? Uh, a glass of water, a beer, a snack, a glass of wine. Uh, we go there and prepare meals. Maybe there's other family members in the kitchen, people that we haven't seen for a while that are visiting us or after the day. Uh, how was your day? How was school? How was this? How was work? Or to hear, uh, let me share something with you that just come up. That all happens in the kitchen. It gives us time also to, to play the games we were talking about, or to be alone for some quiet time, certainly to eat, to visit, to read, uh, conducting business planning. That's all part of the kitchen. And that's why the kitchen is so magnetic. Name another room in the house where all of these various activities occur, and then some. That's why the kitchen is such an attraction, why it's such an important part. That's why it receives the attention that it does. So as people are looking for homes, as they're planning, as they're shopping, as they're going to home shows, they are interested in the kitchen. Other rooms, sure, but the kitchen gets a lot of play. Again, sitting here working on the budget, paying bills, uh, having a, a cooking party or uh, inviting the neighborhood over, sharing good times, whether it's over pastry or whether it's an after dinner situation. 
There's a couple that's reading a uh, or visiting online with children or grandchildren. Pizza, wings, salsa, chips in the kitchen. We may take them other places and go and watch the TV, but uh, who's not a fan of an after school or after work or Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, peanut butter and jelly snack, that's in the kitchen. I, I put that under the category of fulfillment. That helps to fulfill us. We need a snack. We need that peanut butter and jelly or that bowl of ice cream or that cookie or that potato chip. And we get that in the kitchen. So we gravitate to the kitchen. Uh, at all times of the day to meet the various needs that we have. For conversation, if there's other people in the home that are in the kitchen, as we go to the kitchen to meet them, we might join in the activity that they're doing. If they are uh, eating, if they're snacking, if they're drinking, we might join in with that. If they're having pizza or beer or wine or salsa, chips, we might join in that activity. There might be a TV, they might be watching the game in the kitchen or in the family room with the table right there. So there's a lot of things that we do in terms of a fulfillment center. We celebrate, we have graduation parties, we have anniversaries, we have uh, birthdays, we have retirement parties, we have uh, first anniversary of your new car or buying a new car, first time you've ever bought a new car, uh, things that, you know, the mortgage retirement ceremony. We have so many things to celebrate. And then sometimes we want to just get away. Uh, we need some quiet time. Just, just don't bother me and let me get alone. Well, I could go to the bedroom. I could go to the family room. I could go to the porch. I could go to the basement. And those are all fine. And we might do that. But I can also go to the kitchen where no one else is there, sit at the table, have something to drink, have something to eat, collect my thoughts, be my mind by myself, read my tablet or my notebook or read uh, still a paper book for people who like uh, hardcover uh, or paperback books or to read uh, a novel or a book on your tablet or your cell phone. To have new experiences as well to, to okay, so here's an example of a couple that uh, maybe tried a, a, a new sauce for their pasta or they're just having a good time enjoying each other's company, teaching the younger generation how to do something. So we had instructional time in the kitchen. An anniversary, a, uh, a, a gift uh, of jewelry probably, but we do that in the kitchen. Of course, ice cream, dessert, uh, water, milk, uh, coffee, all things that we do in the kitchen to be fulfilled or to sit alone by ourselves. And here's a gentleman that's working on a crossword puzzle, probably notice he's not doing it in pen, as some people do. So he's doing a crossword puzzle. He's having a cup of coffee. Uh, looks like there's something else beside him to eat, but he's enjoying some quiet time at the kitchen table. He's feeling fulfilled. Now, another great thing about the kitchen is what I call the strength of the kitchen. And this is the dependability part of it. No other room in the home do I believe is as dependable or safe or secure or reliable as the kitchen is relatively safe to visit and use. We can be informal. We can come there in our bathrobe, in our pajamas. We can come there uh, without any kind of uh, errors, if you will. It's just a place that we can come and be ourselves with family. So there's a tremendous amount of informality of all the good friends, house guests that we know well. The kitchen accommodates a lot of people. So unlike say a bathroom or a bedroom or other rooms in the home where there's a limited number of participants in that room at any one time, the kitchen is wide open. And going back again to some of the earlier points we were making about the aisleway and the lighting and the safety and the footing and, and the cabinets, uh, what if you had as we showed in that one picture of that big uh, cooking party, what if you had a dozen people or 20 people or even more because you were having a cookout, a barbecue, uh, a, a first of the season football party or uh, watching March Madness or anything that you're doing in your home or that your clients are doing in their home, which would mean the introduction of 
to lots of people in that space. There's no, there's no rules. It's like you know, there are places in the military where uh, they have non-salute areas where if you're in that area uh, in a, uh, a courtyard or other or inside the building or other places, it's a non-salute area. So as you walk past people of higher rank where you would normally salute them, it's just customary not to do so. So that's what we're talking about here. It's not particularly rigid. There's not a lot of rules to obey and to be mindful of. Now, there are some people who close the kitchen. Okay, it's 10 o'clock, the kitchen is now closed. Nobody, nobody come in, stay out. So you wake up at two o'clock and you need a glass of water, you need a, a glass of milk, you need that cookie, uh, you need a, a scoop of ice cream. You go to the kitchen, you sneak in there, maybe you hope nobody will notice, but it's open extended hours. You get up at five in the morning, you head to the kitchen and get a cup of coffee, unless you've got a coffee bar in your bedroom. Uh, that's what we're talking about by open extended hours. And it doesn't close so much. It's not like a, a restaurant that might be open for breakfast, open for lunch, open for dinner, in between. It's not really serving. Uh, we don't put such parameters on our kitchens typically. Single person, uh, small groups, uh, the ability to be ourselves, have a snack, not being really concerned about maybe you know, what we're wearing, or the food that we're in, does our hair comb, have we shaven, have we put on makeup, not so important in the kitchen is what we're talking about here. Now, you're having a party, that's, that's different, but I'm talking about the informality of the kitchen setting in our home or the ability for the entire family to be there, even people of various needs and abilities. That's all accommodated in our kitchen. So to, to kind of bring things back to the beginning, we're looking at this picture, which is breaking bread. And we think of the kitchen, that's, that's a euphemism for eating, uh, breaking bread. So you can't people come to our home. Maybe it's Thanksgiving, maybe it's a meal that we've invited them to, but we talk about breaking bread together. So that's what we're doing in the kitchen, the magnetism of the kitchen. More than any room in the home, again, uh, people from the outside visit us and they congregate, they gather, they are attracted, a magnetic pull to the kitchen. It's as if that kitchen has some kind of additional power that brings people to the kitchen. It is the core, it is the heart of the kitchen, of the home. Again, with home shopping, with renovation, with, uh, you know, if we're doing a, a new floor, if we have a limited budget, if our client has a limited budget, and they just want to do a new floor somewhere in the home, or they want to put in some more lighting, or they want better appliances, newer appliances, they want a, a newer or updated dishwasher, refrigerator, a cooktop, we're talking about the kitchen. With the flooring, the cabinets, and everything. Now we might extend that to the bathroom or other areas at home, but we start with the kitchen. If we want more access to our, our cabinetry, we're talking about again slide outs, pull outs, bins, baskets, uh, things that we can even take with us out of the, the cabinet to the table. We are really making the kitchen a lot more serviceable and versatile for us, not just for us, but for anybody coming into that space. I think we would agree that the kitchen hosts more functions and activities than any other room. Uh, yeah, we have parties in the family room uh, or the basement or the back porch. Uh, but there again, the kitchen, as I mentioned at the outset, it spokes out to other areas of the home. So the kitchen is more than likely connected to uh, the patio or uh, the, the backyard area or the family room. Uh, in the basement, uh, if we have a, a home in the basement, there's likely a kitchen component. Uh, which then extends into that family room, living room, TV watching area, media center uh, of that space. So the kitchen is an integral part. It's connected. It's the battery, if you will, that kind of charges or energizes the rest of the space. And it's not just limited to the people that live there. We bring in so many other people, and that's the visitability aspect, is the, uh, the ability or the nature of the space to accommodate anybody coming into it. We don't have to send out a survey in advance or ask the people who we've invited 
Yeah, when, when someone is like, well, can I bring my cousin? Can I bring my neighbor? We don't have to ask them questions about, well, can they climb steps or can they do this or can they do that? Or they look you know, so tall. It doesn't matter. If we designed a kitchen that accommodates virtually every need and ability, then we're good. And that's where we have an obligation or an opportunity to work with our clients to help them accomplish that. Now, I, I've been using the word us and we, uh, so it begins with us, and we are a laboratory for our clients. Anything that we want to test out, or we want to do for ourselves. Uh, plus, it gives us power when we are selling the job. We're talking to someone else, well, what have I done in my home? I think they like this because I had this in my own one. It worked so well. I've had this for years. It lets us speak with authority because we've actually done it. And again, safe use and passage for everybody. I think we've come to the end of where we wanted to be, so I want to leave space for questions. Uh, so if you've had, if you've been thinking of questions, if I've gone over something too quickly, if I didn't cover it well for you, do you have uh, did this work? With, what about this? Uh, did I ever think of this? Uh, this is the time you can toss it out. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the magnetic part of the kitchen, if we think back to an you know, older home, maybe we've been there, a historical installation, a place we visited, maybe something we saw on TV, something we've seen in a museum, but an older home, if the central part where they do the cooking, where it keeps the space, where maybe they sleep in that space, they eat, they cook, they gather, they, they fellowship with uh, travelers, with neighbors. Oftentimes their neighbors weren't that close to them. So the kitchen was such a central part of a lifestyle at that time. And we brought that to, uh, you know, with us to the, to the present time. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, here's my email address, steve at stevehoffaker.com. My website, stevehoffaker.com. My phone number, 561-685-5555. Uh, you can find me on Google, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on a number of other social sources. So uh, please reach out with your questions. I look forward to interacting with you. And with that, Debbie, I'm going to toss it back to you. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for uh, reminding us, especially of how important the kitchen is um, to our clients and to us. Uh, it, there really is a lot that happens there. And so since you've been talking, there have been a couple of questions that came up. So uh, here's one. Uh, this person says, I have had times when a full kitchen means kids and older people all together, and an elderly person has tripped over a child. How can we design for that when everyone is there? How do we keep them safe? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the more people we have in the space, including dogs and cats, uh, young people, uh, people that might be crawling or using, uh, uh, learning to walk, uh, playing with their toys. A uh, part of that is household rules, but that only goes so far. Wider spaces helps, lighting helps as we get older. Our eyes require more lighting, and that's another factor. So as we're designing uh, for people, a, if we're designing for uh, a 20 to 30-year-old, that's one thing. If we're designing for uh, middle age, if you will, uh, or if we're designing for, for seniors, uh, and that category is wide open, we say it's, you know, 60, 70 plus, um, the lighting requirements are different. The number of lights, the uh, amount of lumens, the brighter, now, you know, Lighting has changed uh, remarkably in the last dozen years. We've gotten away from the traditional incandescent bulb, although they're still available and you may still want to use that, but the wattage has gone away as a measurement to the lumen and the higher the lumen, the brighter the light the more intensive is. And now we have color choices as well from a yellowish traditional incandescent bulb of about a 2700 degree Kelvin, all the way up to a daylight uh, so named, which is a five to 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, and some people are very big fans of the, the, uh, the whitish light. And some people are turned off by that because they remember that yellower light and they're fans of it. And then we have the middle of the road, which is the fluorescent, which is that three to 4,000 range. So people have an affinity for a certain 
temperature of lighting, a brightness, but back to the question, uh, kids underfoot, it's going to happen. So we have as the host, as the parent, uh, as the, the grandparent or whoever's brought their children into the home, we have to be mindful of the fact that they could be in the space. Uh, we have to maybe, as I said, you know, there are less rules, less rigidity in the kitchen. So we have to be mindful that people are sharing that space with us and be able to tolerant of that. So that all you know, comes lighting the flooring, the aisle way widths, the way the cabinet doors open, the way we leave doors open or not, that's all part of it. Okay, and someone, um, thank you, Steve. And someone said, uh, how about the possibility of using baby gates to keep the small kids out? That's something to think about. Sure, sure. Uh, whatever we need, I mean, that that's a safety consideration. So if children are going to uh, be put in a position of potential risk, or if that's going to endanger someone else coming to the space, again, we have cats and dogs that would observe a baby gate and not try to go through it or over it. Uh, those are those are some options. Okay, uh, and then. There was someone asking the question, are there any ADA, um, which means Americans with Disabilities Act regulations for senior or wheelchairs? Uh, there are, uh, and that's, a, that's an excellent question. And let me start the answer by saying that in a single family home, the ADA requirement does not apply. I, 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 uh, single uh, family homes, one bedroom per unit, uh, two, three, or four. One, two, three, or four units per structure. Single family or duplex or triplex or a quad. ADA does not specifically apply. However, it might. Those rules might be in existence. If one, your local uh, building department requires it. Two, uh, the um, IRC, the International Residential Code, in conjunction with ANSI A117.1 has embodied some of those ADA requirements into the residential code, even though they don't show up as quote ADA, but they're in there anyway, for the UFAS, the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards. Those are all coming into the residential building code kind of through the side door. So we're getting them. But the, uh, the space requirement, uh, having that, uh, that four to five foot aisleway is important. We want wheelchairs, uh, a basic planning template for a wheelchair is a width of 36 inches. And in new construction, they just changed it. ANSI's just changed it. It was 60, now it's 67 inches in new construction. Doesn't apply to existing homes. But we have a, uh, a five and a half foot area basically by a three foot area. So if you can cut out a, a big sheet of cardboard or uh, like a piece of plywood, cut that shape out and pop it down in the uh, space and it fits and there's space around it, you're good. If it doesn't fit, then you haven't created enough access area if you want to follow that guideline or that suggestion. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, and then there's um, another one here that you had mentioned and I heard this too. You mentioned the work triangle is being redefined. And that was me, no, 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 that was me redefining. Okay. Okay. And, and yeah, yeah. what what way might there be changes? Do you have some insight on that? Well, that's why that that was me. Uh, that was Steve Hoffaker. Uh, so don't don't be confused or misled. You, know, you won't find it in any literature or online that it's being redefined. What I said was, and what I meant was that the traditional work triangle of the three primary appliances or items that of importance in the kitchen, the sink, where we get water, where we used to wash dishes before dishwashers, uh, but you see even the dishwasher is not part of the work triangle. Uh, but the, the kitchen sink, the slide-in range, the 30-inch slide-in range, uh, and the refrigerator, which used to be the freezer on top, refrigerator on the bottom, the so-called over-under, or then we had the refrigerator on top and the freezer on the bottom, and then we had the side by side with adjacent uh, refrigerator and freezer compartments, which we still have. And we're now doing the armoire style with the French doors on top 
and the freezer drawer and refrigerator drawer sometimes two on the bottom. Uh, so we have that. Now, some homes have, in addition to that, they have island or under cabinet or in cabinet but under countertop refrigerator drawers. We have dishwasher drawers. We have wall ovens. We have wall microwaves. We have microwaves over the cooktop or slide-in range. We have microwaves in cabinet. We have, so the answer is we could have seven, eight, nine different appliances. We have, if you want to include the sink, then we have an island sink. So again, uh, the number is uh, not fixed and in some cases can be you know, rather large. So that's why I call it that. And initially, I took the one, okay, so we have the three and then we add a fourth one for a cooktop and wall oven. So that makes four of the basic components. So I call it a work uh, rectangle, it's a little triangle. But then it got silly because then we had a Pentagon and so forth and so on. So I just call it the kitchen geometry, meaning that we accommodate the various appliances and the how close they are to each other, how we access them, the number of steps. Do we have to walk through the island, which was the whole point of having space to access the various important ingredients of the kitchen without having a detour or some, some obstruction in our path. Thank you for explaining that a bit more. Can that help? Uh, yes, I think so. Thank okay. you. So there's someone else that has a question here. She says, uh, I have a stubborn client and will be in a wheelchair soon. Absolutely will not allow me to design her kitchen at a four foot plus clearance in, in the kitchen. She demands three foot. Besides a clear disclaimer in print, do you have any ideas? She says, I've ex already explained it to death. <laughs> okay. Um, and without uh, bringing the other person online or asking her to, re her to respond, uh, whatever. Uh, that comes back to the universal design or feasibility aspect where we depersonalize it. So you're designing for the client and you really would like four feet and you've explained why and they, they want the smaller design and in the final analysis, it is their design. They're the ones paying for it. They're the ones living with it. Uh, disclaimers are fine and I do recommend a, a release or a waiver in our uh, scope of services that say, uh, this is not what I recommend, but I'm doing it because uh, you have, I have selected this against my recommendation, something to that effect. But when we talk about the universal design and physical aspect of it, we're saying, okay, I know you're okay with this. I'm not talking about you anymore. I'm talking about people that might come to the home to visit with you, to, to come to an event that you're having. And then you could come back and say, oh, nobody ever comes to visit me. I live alone. It's just me. I don't really care. Well, then you're back to where you were. But if they will accept that and say, and really consider that the same reason that we uh, look at eliminating steps to the front door or the side door or creating an accessible driveway or path to the backyard if we're having outdoor events. It's not that the people living in the home can't use them, they're used to it, but it's who's coming to the home and what kind of accommodation do they need. And I can't because I'm having a party uh, a week from tonight go out and start a major construction project to accommodate people that I've already invited. If my home already has this, then I'm good to go. And I have to make, I don't have to make any special accommodations for it. And that's a new strategy, a new paradigm of approaching any kind of design, whether it's interior or exterior, so that anyone of any ability, limited vision, limited balance, using canes, walkers, wheelchairs, uh, leg braces, uh, you know, walking on the arm or with assistance of someone else, anybody, uh, a, a, a poor gait where they can't pick their feet up very well, they tend to stumble, whatever that is, we don't have to worry about that. We've invited people over and they can be comfortable coming in and using our facilities. Thank you, Steve. That's an interesting way to present that to someone. Um, there was uh, another question, and I did hear you say this, and the person just wants to hear it again. What was the new 67 inch dimension for that ANSI? Um, is that that's in, that's in new construction, and that's the length of the wheelchair space. Uh, so, in designing a space for a wheelchair to be in, 
and to be able to turn at 67 inches front to back. And that's the new anti uh, A117.1 uh, regulation. So you can Google that and find it. Okay, great. And uh, I'm not seeing any other questions at this point in time. So I'd like to thank you uh, very much, uh, Steve, for your um, expertise and your time here today. I'd like to thank all of you for being with us today. And once again, uh, a shout out to Gebert for sponsoring our session today and for all of the sessions for the month of September. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you again, Steve. Thank you.